chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, from the message paraphrase. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. Complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love. Each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet. No day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master, Jesus Christ. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you. Oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. So friends, Confirm God's invitation to you, His choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this, and you'll have your life on a firm footing. The streets paved and the way wide open in the eternal kingdom of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ.
So I'm going to give him great thanks and praise in this house. Thank you. Thank you. I know that we're looking forward to the traditional sayings and adages and uh, New Year statements. And I'm just, I'm just telling you right now, I'm not looking forward to the New Year as a whole. I'm looking for today. Yes. Right now. Why worry about something that has not happened yet? Seize the moment. Yes. Yes. Stay in the moment. Stay in the spirit today and you'll be in the spirit tomorrow. Yes. Train yourself for now and then you'll be there then. Yes. Let's take it day by day. It doesn't hurt to look forward. We always do that anyway. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to stress over something. I don't know what's going to happen yet. But what I do know is God is in the house. And whatever you need today is what you should focus on and receive it. And if there's any resistance, God can break that chain no matter how strong it may seem. In the name of Jesus, we have power and victory right now, today, this moment. We're stressing over tomorrow. Let's seize the day. Amen? And let's give this day unto him because it is the Lord's day. It is his moment. It is his house. And it is you are his people. And he inhabits the praises of every one of us who will live up the sacrifice of praise. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus. Praise your wonderful name, Lord, in this house. And I pray in the name of Jesus right now, God, that your presence, and we reverence your presence, and we reverence your word, your Bible, your scripture. Father, we right now in the name of Jesus pray that this will get engrafted into our being and into our souls and that faith is going to rise up in this place. Belief is going to rise up in this place. Breakthrough is coming to somebody who needs it this morning. The word of God preached is going to drive out every insecurity in this house. No one is going to leave here less than competent for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray that confidence in you will reach its completion in every person in the sound of my, under the sound of my voice in this place as the word is being preached and taught in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody agree and say amen. 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 I'm going to use a familiar passage of scripture that I've alluded to not long ago, but I'm going to give you a little more angle out of that scripture because of it is the beginning of the year. And so would you give God great thanks and praise for the word of God this morning? Hallelujah. Matthew 6 and 33, if you'll stand with me, we're going to start reading there. Stand with me, Max, Matthew 6 and 33. And the Bible says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not what? Do not worry about when? Tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day. Is its own trouble. No need to add any more trouble to your day. Don't worry. Somebody said it's easier said than done. But it can be done. And everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. You know Mark Twain said that I've suffered a great many catastrophes in my life. Most of them never happened. And uh, I want to, just for a, minute, a moment, encourage you that you need to believe God. 
We don't need to put our total investment in what is on the media today about what we need to worry about because media should not tell you what to worry about. They will try to tell you, but you should not receive what the CDC and all of the other uh, environmental and political and all of the other pundits on the talking box yeah. telling you, you need to worry about this. You need to worry about that. Right. You need to worry about who holds the, the, the codes to the nuclear button. You know, you need to worry about Russia. You need to worry about Gog and Magog. And you need to worry about this. You need to worry about that. You need to worry about your kids. You need to worry about what's happening in the American society. You know, there's too many sales, too many pundits trying to tell us what to worry about. And there's a after every commercial that gives you a new medicine, <laughs> most of the commercial is a fast speaking disclosure about what to worry about if you take this medicine. That's right. That's right. Good grief. They must, I mean, the list is that long. I mean, the, the commercial is this big, but then the disclaimer is this big. So the worry about getting something relief on a medicine, I'm not against medicine. Medicine has done some marvelous things. When it was done correctly, I believe that it has been a gift. And uh, if we uh, need it and it's used properly, I believe it has brought relief and healing. But my goodness, the worry they pile on top of. You see, that's why the Bible says that God, when he blesses, he adds no sorrow. See, when God blesses you, there's no worries about the blessing. Amen. But I will caution you during this message today what we do need to concentrate on. And we do need to know what God requires. And so we see that there are three main causes to worry. And one of them is external. External circumstances and understand threatening our scene and security. We feel from time to time and um, uh, <clears throat> but from the time we're born, we are inundated with what to worry about. You know, Erkson said our first crisis is to trust versus mistrust. That's our biggest dilemma is to trust or mistrust and we do feel the world is a safe place at times but other times you're not sure so the philosopher said this anxiety is the price of being in the world there's no way to live and not feel threatened or insecure at certain times how many know we're going to feel insecure at times? We're going to feel challenged at times. We're going to feel like we don't have the answer to things in certain moments. Secondly, there's not only external challenges to worry and temptations to worry, but there are internal conditions that make us worry. Freud said anxiety comes from the conflict between our ego states. And he called three areas of this state of ego. One was id, id, ego, and then superego. Id is the childish part of us. And then ego is the logical part of us. And then superego is the moral part of us. And the id says, I want it, and I want it now. And then ego replies and says, you need to really think this through. And then superego preaches back, says, no, you shouldn't do that. So we feel anxiety between the ideal life 
And we want the real life that we have. You see, because there's an ideal life we dream about and think it ought to be like on some of the Hallmark movies. But then there's also real life. So while worry can be a serious problem, it is important to remember that mild anxiety, and you've heard me allude to this before, mild, and mild anxiety is good in the sense that it motivates us to action and accountability. So there is some what I call, and we've learned, good stress, and then there's, not, there's stress that is not good. So thirdly, we worry because we feel separated from God. And it may be a real separation or it, because of our sins and, and maybe some guilt. Or it may be an imaginary separation because we can't accept God's unconditional love. And we feel that we never measure up to what we, He wants us to be. So the answer to the feeling of separation for a moment from God is to set our hearts at rest in His presence, according to the Word. First John wrote, he said, set our hearts, set our hearts. How do we set our hearts? By fasting and praying, as we will do in the beginning of this year. Setting your hearts. Is that, you know, fasting is a way, is another way, let me say another way, uh, a, a, a description of what fasting is. Fasting is like setting the reset button inside of you. Reset. Fasting resets things. And priority becomes important. And so God loves us with an everlasting love. Does anybody agree with that today? Amen. And so, and we accept that. We know He always, He's always with us, no matter what we're going through or whatever is going on around us. We must believe at all times He is with us. Now Jesus makes Three key statements to teach us the secret. There is a secret in the scripture to living without worry. Somebody says, boy, if I could ever live without worry, I would be on top of the world. You can do this. Worry is going to come, but you don't have to accept it. Worry is going to knock on the door, but you don't have to open it. Worry is going to try to invite itself, but you can cut it off. So it's not that worry won't come or you won't be tempted to worry. It's that you need to reset and say, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to worry. I'm supposed to believe. I'm not supposed to worry. I'm supposed to act in faith and know that God has my best interest in mind. In Matthew 6 and 28, the Bible says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Then he says this interesting little statement at the end. O you of little faith. Now, then he goes on, therefore, do not worry. Now, your God is telling you something that is not impossible. If God said, don't worry, that means you can live without worry. Yeah. God is not going to try to tell you you can do something you cannot do, and especially if he's going to help you. And one of the ways you're going to be helped today is that, first of all, you need to believe 100% without any, without any doubt that the Bible is the unadulterated word of God. And the Bible is true no matter what anybody ever says to you. The Bible is true. If you can settle that today and listen to the word of God, then you can heighten your faith experience and believe and be worry free walking out these doors today in Jesus mighty name. So therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles seek. That is another word, another place is pagan. And that's what people who don't believe in God seek. 
For your heavenly Father knows that you need how many of these things? Aww. Do you know God knows what you need? Yeah. And He knows all that you need. Many times you only know in part what you need when God actually knows the rest of the things you need. Yeah. Y'all see that? Yeah. So your heavenly father knows all these things. Then he says this, but seek what? First. Now, do you realize that God now jumped into priority? He's telling you what you need to do first. The reason why some people are still worrying because they do not put things first that God says to put first. Amen. If we would just put first the things God said to put first, yeah. it's amazing how the other things will follow and be in order. Yeah. But the very first thing is what throws everything off in life. The very thing I'm going to try to show you in Scripture today, seek first the kingdom. People, it is not what is convenient. It is what is First, how many know? Many times, I I know I'm speaking to somebody besides me. That um, whatever is first on the priority list is not always the easiest. I really need to have this first, but many times, what is first it seems harder. It seems laborious. It seems out of reach at times. It seems inconvenient and it also seems inex too expensive for me to invest. And so understand God says this one thing is what messes us up and especially in the context of worry. The reason why most people worry, if not all, as a matter of fact, according to this scripture, everyone worries because they did not do first things first. That's a fact. Somebody says, I got a lot to worry about. You only need to put one thing first. If you put that one thing first, all the things you're worried about will be null and void. So watch this. Don't worry. Then down in verse 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God. And then he says, and his righteousness and all these things things, we've talked about it recently, and I'm going to add to this message from then. All these what? Things shall be added to you. And these are not necessarily spiritual things. Because in context, he's talking about things that are on the earth. Clothes. Food. Jesus says, I want you to notice what Jesus tries to focus. Now, everything Jesus said is so important, so don't try to skip over it in your Bible reading. He said, I want you to take a look at the lilies. And a lot of times we read through these verses and we just look at it as poetic. We look at it as something nice to say. But Jesus actually is doing an in-depth teaching. He says, I want you to look at the lilies. Look at the lilies. Wait a minute. Look at the lilies. I want you to look at the lilies. Well, I've seen the lilies. They're nice. I've planted the lilies. They're nice. I mean, they're beautiful. I've decorated with them. But Jesus says, I want you to look at the lilies of the field. The ones that are by themselves. Wildflowers are abundant in Galilee. And this statement is like his earlier in verse 26 that we've already looked into. Look at the birds. Earlier in this context, he said, look at the birds of the air. Stay with us now. He said, look at two things. Look at the lilies. Earlier, he said, look at the birds in the air. Look at the lilies in the field, not the ones that are on a farm, but the ones in the field. There are certain times of the year that the wildflowers on the side of the road look beautiful. Nobody is nurturing them. No one is helping them. They are naturally growing and producing. Two things, he said, look at the lilies of the field. And then earlier he said, look at the birds. In verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Do you all know this? Say yes. Yeah, yeah. We need to learn from nature. Learn from nature that if God takes care of the world he created. Come on, somebody. He will take care of us because we are the most important thing 
of all creation to him. So if the lilies of the field are being taken care of, and the birds in the air are being taken care of, you don't feed them. Some of you do. But you know what I'm talking about. I go, when I, Nathan and I hunt, we enjoy uh, the wildlife and nature around us. God takes care of us. It's interesting being in a tree when the sun is just starting to come up. You hear the woods waking up. It's an interesting thing to watch and hear. It's dead silence when we're going out there at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, whatever it may be. But when that sun starts, you, you hear the first little chirp. And then you'll hear another chirp over here. Then you'll hear some movement. Mm -hmm. Then you hear these things start, and everything is starting to communicate like a symphony. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, no one feeds those. God takes care of that every day. Mm -hmm. Every single morning. So when we look at this, we need to learn from nature that if God takes care of all that, that you're not taking care of, and then the Bible says, I want you to realize that I'm going to take care of you. <clears throat> Why? Because you're made in my image. So we learn from nature. The lesson of the lilies of the field is different from the lesson of the birds in the air. And I'll show you why. In the sense that while birds, they work, they actually get up every day, all day long, they're working. They're finding food and bugs and and, and, and things to eat. So the birds in the air, in a sense that while the birds work together and gather food, the flowers grow without toil or spinning, without any work. Are y'all getting this? The point is that God rightly and richly provides for us in ways we don't even recognize at time that God opened that door and you didn't realize it. God gave you that breakthrough and you didn't realize it. God showed you what to do and you didn't realize it was from Him. God clothes the grass of the field with beautiful flowers that are neither productive or enduring. Watch this. They are here today and tomorrow the Bible says that they are thrown into a fire or a picture, the word picture is they are thrown into an oven. And this refers to a clay furnace used for burning grass, which ashes will fall through holes and be destroyed. Now watch this. Not even Solomon, the Bible says, in all of his splendor and wealth was dressed like these flowers God has created. Now Jesus said to his disciples, O oh, ye of little faith, I want you to take a look at nature. I want you to take a look at the flowers out here that you say, ah, and ooh, and how beautiful they are. I want you to look at the birds flying by and the wildlife that no one takes care of. Who's taking care of them? God is. How much more do you think humans are important to God than animals? Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of animal commercials about dogs being rescued and cats being rescued and and I'm not going to offend my cat lovers and dog lovers in the house because I'm a dog lover, less of a cat lover. But I like animals. But Blackie's a good cat. He's cool. He's out. And he's got another friend with us. But I'm going to tell you that Jesus takes care of those. And he's saying, I want you all to use at least, at least common sense. Common sense, not even supernatural, not even spiritual. Common sense said, if God's taking care of all that, why would he leave us on our own? Why would he leave us to struggle? Why would he leave us alone and feeling alone? And as if there's no interaction, God only loves animals and not people. I want y'all to get it right. Every time you see an animal commercial, God loves people more than animals. That's right. That's right. Amen. He didn't make He didn't make us look like animals. He made us look like Him. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, God is proud of His children. And He says, when He created humans, that was the best thing He created on the earth. 
And watch this. The root of worry. Can I tell you what the where a root of worry comes from? And y'all are not going to like this because sometimes we, we are <clears throat> Christians who base our life on worrying, thinking it's okay. The root of worry is unbelief. And unbelief is sin. So wait a minute, sure, I, I've been worried about things all day and now you're calling me a sinner. Well, I didn't say it. But the root of worry is unbelief. We worry because we don't believe God's going to take care of us. And we put stress and loads on our physical, phys physiological, and our spiritual bodies. And it's proven that stress works against our health. It's already proven. I've seen animals. Animals can stress and die. Humans can do the same thing. But the root problem to worry is unbelief. So watch this. And the answer to that is a deep and personal and trust in God Almighty. Notice the opening statement of the Bible in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If He created it, He hasn't forgotten it. You see, everything is under His power. I want you to listen up. It's under, we, we like saying under his control. He watches over this world and he watches over us. Now can I tell you, God, God cares for his creation and he cares for us in ways we often never see. Now I want to tell you right now that God is in control of everything except your will. But by the way, he takes that back at the end. Because you may think you deserve to go to a certain place, but he's going to open the books. And he's going, we're going to be judged one day. Don't, don't people say, judge not lest you be judged. Listen, let me tell you something. You better judge yourself. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you'll help yourself in the end. And we need to judge what's bad and good. If you don't know the difference between good and bad, you're going to be destroyed. So you got to judge. And God's going to judge us all. You see, because we've got to realize He cares, but He's just. And so Jesus says, He said this. This is what Jesus said, not just the apostles or anyone else. Jesus said, do not work. Do not do this. Now, if he said, do not do this, then worry must be an act of your will. Worry is an act of your will. You worry because you want to. Somebody said, I don't like this message. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, don't worry about it. It's going to help you. <laughs> so worry is an act of your volition. You might say, no, worry just pops up. No, you let it in. So in other words, in view of everything you see in creation and how God takes care of what, uh, of it, and he takes care of it with abundance and provision, he is saying, don't worry. Because the Bible actually says the pagans run after all these things. The Gentile or pagans. The pagans run after these things. That's not a compliment. If you say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be around pagans and I don't believe pagans. I don't, I, no, pagans, are, they're, they're, those are people that are not going to make heaven. They're pagans. But the Bible says when you worry, you act like one. We don't like these kind of messages because if we want the fluffy stuff, we want how is God going to bless me in 22? I want all the bless. I want to know how I'm going to be blessed. I want to know how you're going to get blessed because there's a way to a blessing, and there's a way to refuse the blessing. He adds the the worry-filled life is one is that. Um, one of running really fast. That's the worried life, think of this. 
Somebody's worried and they run fast, feverishly, at a pace driven by anxiety. So watch this. The worry-filled life is overly focused, watch this, on material things. If you're focused too much on material things, we are going to worry more than have faith. So, instead of more important matters of life, we worry on things that are not going to last. So, for us to obey His command, how many know it's a command, do not worry? And Jesus said, do not worry. He didn't say it as a suggestion. He said it as an ultimate command. Do not worry. I don't know how you're going to study that. Word wise, commentaries or whatever. It simply means do not worry. And you cannot change the fact that it is a command. There are more than ten commandments in the Bible. How many know that? So we see we have to stop making things so important and make the main thing the main thing. Which is to what? Seek God first. Think about God first. Amen. Put God in your choices. Put the choices out there and ask God, which one should I do? The very fact that you ask God first is going to help you in which one you should do. And somebody says, when I ask God and I ask him which one should I do, sometimes I don't know what to do even after that. The fact that you ask God first yeah. is going to help you even if you choose something you're not sure about. Right. I'm telling you, that's what God will do. He'll help you even to those areas where you cannot understand what to do. That's the secret of living without worry. Now I can get to the message. Let's break this statement down and understand what Jesus is saying and how to apply it to our lives. And if you're taking notes, get your priorities in order. If you want to look forward to this, 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 this um, new year, and we should look chronologically at the year. We should try to reset and, and reboot and, and refocus and revive and any other reason you can come up with. You understand? We should look forward. But we've got to realize that whatever you're looking forward to, the priority needs to be in order. In order for things to work properly in our lives, in Jesus Christ blessing us. How many love the blessings of the Lord? I love it when God wants to bless me. I love it that God wants to bless me more than I understand what a blessing is. And so, but there, there is, there's conditions to God's blessings. You have to be in the right place, the right mind, the right field. You need to be connected to right people. You need to be connected to God first. Amen. So when he says, get your priorities in order. That's what he's saying when he's saying seek first. God is saying get your priorities in order. Seek first. Why? Be Wait, I don't have time for that. Wait a minute. If you don't seek first, you're going to waste more time on something you thought you didn't have time to do. You're going to need it more afterwards because how many know that when we do things without God, the mistakes can get longer and bigger and costly. Mm -hmm. Seek first the kingdom. That which is first means that which is most important. Can y'all say amen to that? Amen. Now, you don't have to make a list. Somebody said, oh, you just made it easy for me. There are, things, there are things that are so important in our lives, we don't need to put them on a list. You don't have to make a list to understand what is important because several things may be equally important. But understand the things that are more important than others so that you are driven by the urgent and distracted by things that do not matter. You see, because don't forget, and or I should say this, don't get your life filled with so many activities that you remain and keep that anxiousness alive. Can I want to say, I, I, I learned this, simplicity equals peace. Say that with me. Simplicity equals peace. There are things that we just need to keep it simple. Somebody said it, keep it simple, stupid, right? Simplicity equals peace. 
How many know complexity sometimes just drives that stress barometer way up? Mm -hmm. Simplicity equals peace. Complexity equals stress. Focus on the spiritual, not the material. I'm breaking it down. What do we need as a priority? Focus on the spiritual first, not the material. Amen. We have trained ourselves to only focus on the material first because we live in a materialistic world and we live in this physical. But the Bible says, don't be fooled by what you see like this because faith sees beyond in the invisible. And so we understand that faith is first. No matter what you do, faith is first. Whatever you plan on is faith going to be affected. Whatever you decide is faith going to be strengthened. So we got to understand prioritizing means that we need to deal with the spiritual first, not the physical. God does not want you to focus on the physical things as a priority. It is the spiritual things that are first. Therefore, we must guard our journey into the kingdom of God. We must guard our journey in learning. We must guard the church. We must guard our gatherings. We must guard the things that mess with our spiritual lives. Because everything you touch, everything you smell, Everything in the senses that we're taught here on earth is going to decay and die and will never leave this earth un without a fire. It's all going to burn and be renovated. Only the spiritual is going to make it through the pearly gates of heaven. And therefore, if that is the thing we're working towards and working for, then anything that takes its place is unbelief and worry and sin seek ye first the kingdom of God Amen. he said not second not third but first if your spiritual life is equal with your material life you still have not prioritized the spiritual first you must get up and every morning decide in your heart and mind I'm going to praise God in this day I'm going to love God in this day I'm going to get a word from God today. Yeah. That's your first priority before you get up and eat Fruit Loops for breakfast. You will have sanity in the spirit if you put God first and he will order every step of the day in your life. Hallelujah. Fire. Thank you, Lord Jesus. One day a man saw a frog on a sidewalk and he picked it up. The frog said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. The man put the frog in his pocket without kissing it. And the frog said, wait, why haven't you kissed me yet? The man responded, at this point in my life, I prefer to have a talking frog. <laughs> Sometimes you got up and had days like that, haven't you? Amen. You and I have to live by priorities and know what is first. Then you, you don't have to worry. About, watch this. You you don't have to worry about what's second. Did you hear me? You say, "Well, I need a list." No, you don't. I mean, if you want to prioritize things, you got to be on the list. I understand that. You don't need a list. You don't need to worry about what's second. I think that's awesome. Because if you put God first, you don't need to worry about what's next. We need to live by faith, church. Hallelujah. Not by sight. Right. So what you mean? The only thing I need to concentrate on is what first? What's first? Absolutely. God just freed you up right then and there. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll think about what God's first, but I, 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 I want to start concentrating on what's second, third after that. Really, really, what you're saying is you're not really putting God first. You're just going for what's second. Mm -hmm. Because the second is material. And the second, second is, is the natural. First things first. If you'll get in the spirit, somebody says, 
You know, that's not... The problem with the church today is that they've lost their cutting edge in the spiritual realm. And especially in America. Because you can study and see that other parts of the country, they've got to concentrate on the miracle from God. They've got to concentrate on how God's going to help them. It seems like we only need to concentrate on God helping us when we come to church and hope the pastor's going to have some type of pick-me-up message. That's not church. There's days coming, even to America. We don't know when, and I'm not preaching doom and gloom, but I can tell you the Bible is telling us that there's a setup coming. There's a situation coming where we're going to be pressured to find out what's important to you. It's coming. God can allow America with all the bloodshed of innocent babies and just that one. We've got blood on our hands. Right. We've, we've got stuff going on that he judged Sodom and Gomorrah way before he did us. You don't think God's going to, uh, you think God's just going to let America just, just skirt on by? No. It ain't going to happen that way, folks. There's a day coming that you're going to find out how much you practiced what was important. Because what you practice is how you will react. You might say, well, I, I know God's important, but I'll do what I want until it's time. No, you won't. I've said this many times. I've been in ministry 35 plus years. I've been around people dying in my arms. I've been in many people's deathbed. And I've seen some people never change, even taking their last breath. And the pastor's right here. Right. Why? Because they train themselves to be that way. Yeah. Don't say, well, I'll just, I'll just reach out to God right at the last minute. Some people have. Many people haven't. You say, well, I'm too old to change. You are? I can tell you miracle after miracle of 80-year-old people coming to Christ. One I love is an 80-year-old Jewish Hebrew fellow in our church in South Florida back in the day. 80 years old. Received Christ and started, at 80 years old, received Christ, started speaking in tongues and not running the whole church. It's been there for years. Re embraced it all. Jesus can change anybody anywhere at any time from anything. Yeah. All you have to do is receive him. What is the most important jobs you need to get done? What are your most important goals you need to accomplish? Seek the kingdom first. And those things will be added to you. I'm going to go quickly now. Next, rest in the sovereignty of God. You see, the kingdom of God means he's in charge. He is in charge. What that means is that he owns everything. There's some chaos things going on because we have an enemy and a devil and our flesh. The devil does, should not get the blame for what you're doing. Many times... The devil is not at fault for what you're doing. Your flesh is doing something. Yeah. The, the most evil you can be is letting your flesh take over. Somebody said, no, the most evil you can be is letting Satan take over. No, Satan only exploits what you allow to get loose. Mm -hmm. Satan's not allowed to just come in and do whatever he wants. He has to find a weakness that you petted. A weakness that you nurtured, a weakness that you allow. Then the devil sees that as an invitation. So we got to realize you don't give, they, Satan doesn't have that kind of power. He's powerful, but he's good at exploiting your weakness. And you only get weak because you haven't prioritized and put God first. Somebody say, man, this is good amen. preaching this morning. So the kingdom of God is God is in control. The Bible says he's the, Satan is the god of this world. The world uh, in, in the Greek is cosmos, which means world system. Satan is the god of the world system. But the Bible says God is possessor of heaven and earth. So God is in charge of everything ultimately till the end. But he gave you the power of will and volition. And he's allowed you to even Resist his charge and do your own thing. I implore you, don't do that. Put him first. We're in chaos, but God operates in control. He's, 
He's not out of control. He's in control. All things work together for good. Remember that in Romans 8 and 28? All things work together for good. Can I tell you that it's referring to the things of God, not the things that you did something stupid and crazy and, and you say, oh, that God's just going to use that and work it all together for good. I've seen this verse used from, from celebrities to people in the church that God wanted me to go out and be a prostitute and, and be a drunkie. And he's going to work all that to good so I can come back and have a ministry to them. That is hogwash. Yeah. God doesn't put you in the filth to come and do something holy. That was sin. That was sin in your hell. God had nothing to do with that. And God ain't going to use that to get you a ministry when you come to Christ. That's the most sickening philosophy I've ever heard in the church. Now, can God help you relate if that happens? Yes. But God doesn't send you off to have those experiences so you can come back and be a better minister. That's ridiculous. Don't ever anybody tell you that immature, silly philosophy. I've seen it many times in the church. Well, God let me go through all this sin so I can come back and be able No, he didn't. You got into sin because it was sin. God had nothing to do with that. The Bible in Romans 8 and 28, keep it in context. It's only for those that are called to his purpose, not yours. God, all things do not work together for you in sin. The Bible says sin will send you to hell and the wages of sin is death. Not, nothing's going to work out for you. Are y'all getting this? Yes. So all things work together for good for those who are doing it God's way, not the other way. Now somebody quit saying that verse out of context. Say amen to that. Amen. So we see this verse does not always apply to every situation. He directs our steps if we trust him. Look at Proverbs now. Y'all like Romans 8 and 28? Well, I want you to like Proverbs 3 and 5. Amen. You like it in Romans 8 and 28? How about liking Proverbs 3 and 5? You say, well, I don't like Proverbs 3 and 5. Why? Because it makes me have to work for it. It makes me have to prioritize. Oh, okay. I see where you are. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not some, not part, but all. God is into all of it or not. Either all His or not. How many know that? Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all, 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 all. Do y'all see that? All your ways. Do what? Acknowledge Him. What is that? Seeking God first. Is that not? That's not just a New Testament philosophy or phenomenon or the Word. It's in the Old Testament. So in all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall direct your path. Notice what the priorities in the Scripture. You've got to decide that you're going to love the Lord with all of your heart. You've got to decide that you're going to lean not to your own understanding of what feels right to you, what feels good to you. You've got to decide that you've got to acknowledge Him in all of your ways. And then you get the blessing that He'll direct you. Are you there? Yeah. First, the kingdom of God. It means we have to have the desire. Listen, if you, when we seek the kingdom of God first, when we seek the kingdom of God, that also means that you have a desire to enter into it. If you're seeking, you're seeking to get in. Hello, somebody. And if you're seeking to get in, you're seeking to follow its rule. So if you're not seeking to get in, you're not seeking. Because seeking means I want to go there. I want to seek to find it and be a part of it. Now watch this. So the way we enter into the kingdom is that we're born again. According to John 3, we're born again. Amen. The Bible says you can't be in Christ unless you're born again. And so when we seek the kingdom, it means we yield to the will of God. The word kingdom, if you on Wednesday nights we've been learning this, the word kingdom means the rule of God. That's what it means. So you're seeking not a place to hang out. You're, you're, you're seeking a place to be in, under its rule. So the, the kingdom means the rule of God. You can't have a kingdom without a king. And God is king and he's exalted Jesus as Lord of all. How many know that? And so realize, so if I seek the kingdom, I must personalize that, that to mean I seek the rule of Jesus in my heart. If you're seeking the kingdom, you're seeking for Jesus to be in charge of your life. So he says in Romans 14 and 9, he said he died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. 
He's going to be the Lord. How many know that today? If I seek the kingdom, I, it means I'm active in announcing. If you're seeking the kingdom, you're preaching the kingdom. If you are not seeking the kingdom, you're not preaching the kingdom. And if you're not preaching the kingdom, you're not seeking the kingdom. Because the kingdom is all about a good place, a good experience, and a breakthrough that it is so awesome and so um, incomprehensible that you've got to tell other people, you've got to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. When you seek the kingdom of God, that means that you will talk about it. That means you will sing about it. That means you will study about it. That means you'll pray about it. That means you want to do everything yeah. you can to be in the kingdom of God. Only way I can tell that you're in the kingdom, you can't help but keep your mouth Flapping for the kingdom of God and telling people how wonderful and how good God is. You ain't in the kingdom if you ain't preaching. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm in the kingdom and I talk about it. You see, how many know you'll talk about the junk you go through? As a matter of fact, you'll get on Facebook. You'll want so many likes about to agree with you, to make you feel good about your situation, however, whatever it is. It's amazing to, it's amazing to me. You'll want people to know about your crud. Yeah, drama. You, you, want, you want people to know about your, your, how you've been done wrong. You want, to know, you want to let people know about this and about that, all the negative stuff you're going through. Well, if you're in the kingdom, then you should be telling people what things are being done right. You should be telling people how good it is. You should be telling people what peace and joy that you have. We got, we got enough of the other. And you're telling me, well, you can be in the kingdom and not talk about it. Where in the Bible do you see people encountering God and not talking about it? It doesn't work. If you're in the kingdom, you're a preacher. Not because you want everybody to know you're right. You just want everybody to know how good it is. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Here we go. The gospel of the kingdom. The Bible says in Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Y'all want, want some good endings? Y'all want the ending? How many sometimes you can't hardly wait to read the rest of the book or get to the end of the book to see how it ends? Sometimes you like to flip to the end to find out how it's really going to turn out. If we'll all start preaching, I think the end will come a little quicker. Hallelujah. Amen. We can run out of things to do. Amen. God wants us to be on fire and preach Amen. the kingdom of God. Here's the last thing. Do things God's way. Do things God's way. We also, to seek God's righteousness. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? Yes. His righteousness. So he said, do things God's way. Do it the way the book says. With, with, uh, which simply means what is right in God's eyes. Righteousness means what is right in <coughs> God's eyes, not ours. Well, I think this, I don't care what you think. What does the Bible say? Well, I think, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to hear what you, I feel. I don't want to hear what you feel. I want to know what God says. Well, I think it means this. No, I don't want you to say, I think it means anything. I want to know what God said. It means personal holiness. And this is what righteousness means, personal holiness. I didn't say public holiness because there's a lot of churches that have a public display of holiness, but on the inside are dead men bones. I didn't say a public display of holiness. I said righteousness is a personal holiness. That means you're holy when nobody's looking. And it does mean social justice. Do our best to help people and relieve people and help get people delivered. We do our best. It means peace. The Bible says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's what the Bible said. And righteousness, they all go together. Personal holiness, social justice, peace, and righteousness are all in that category. And the Bible said in, in Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, and, he, and his name will be called Wonderful, 
Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over, the, over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's the kind of kingdom we're in. Come on, Sam. Romans 14 and 17. I love this verse. I love this verse. It says, For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got to quit resisting the Holy Ghost. Let, let, it, let, let it jump on you. Come on, somebody. Let, let, let Pentecostal fervor come out of us in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I, I'm glad that we're not just following a litany. We're following something that will light you up. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Are y'all here? Amen. So this is good. This is wonderful. This is the way it ought to be. How many know what to do first? How many want to care about second? Don't worry about it. Remember, worry will take over every day if you let it. Amen. God doesn't want you in unbelief. All of us have to check this. Even your pastor all the time. We have to stay, put that in check. Now, wait a minute. No, God's first. Stop, 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 stop. Heart rate go down. Blood pressure come down. God's first. Holy Ghost, what you want? What do you want, Holy Ghost? That's what we'll do. There's a right and a wrong way to do things and there's a productive and unproductive way to do things and here's the promise all these things will be given or provided for you and I instead of having to control everything in life you will live on the gifts of God learn how to live on the gifts of God do what we are supposed to do and live and write and prioritize and then let God in other words I, I've said this for years you've heard it do your best and let God do the rest. And the best you can do is putting God first. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to give you one little illustration from my wife's, one of my wife's favorite stores, J.C. Penney. In 1920, the J.C. Penney Company owned 200 stores nationwide. 20, 1920s. Ten years later, it operated 1,400 stores. Mr. Penny's personal income was over 1.5 million a year, which is equal to 150 million today. His personal estate had grown to over 1 billion in today's dollars. Then, at the age of 55, he lost nearly everything when the Great Depression hit in 1930. <coughs> As a result, he became helpless, hopeless. I should say hopeless. His health failed so drastically, his doctors thought that he would die. He was hospitalized in a sanitarium in Michigan. One night in the hospital, he felt that he would die in the night. So he penned a letter saying goodbye to his family. And when he awoke the next morning, he heard singing. He got out of his bed and followed the sound to a chapel service in the hospital. And he heard the people saying and singing the song, God will take care of you. The, word, the words of the song washed away his worries and he found new faith. His health returned and he went on to rebuild his fortune to an even greater level than before. He not only built a thriving business, he gave a lot of money away to Christian charities, and you can look those things up. He lived to be 95 and frequently quoted a Bible passage he said was his favorite, which is Psalm 26, verse 1. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. Can y'all say amen? amen? Let me tell you, that's what God wants to do today. He wants you to have peace. He wants you, first of all, to trust Him. Trust Him. 
Trust Him. Let's trust the Lord. Let's trust Him with this year coming. Let's trust Him when? Day by day. Day by day. Can you stand with me? right now, I want to pray with somebody who needs it. I want to pray with somebody who says, I need a breakthrough. I want to, I want to, I want to set my priorities today before I leave this church, and I'm going to seek the Lord with all of my heart. And then if that's you, whatever you need, whatever you want to put at the Lord's feet today, let us pray with you. You come. Come be at this altar.